Dr. Heather Goldstone oversees Woodwell Climate Research Center's communications activities, bringing the rich stories of Woodwell scientists to diverse public audiences. Dr. Goldstone has extensive experience as both a scientist and a journalist, and she's passionate about melding data and narrative in climate change stories that build awareness and inspire action. Dr. Goldstone came to Woodwell Climate Center from WGBH Radio, where she founded and hosted a weekly science-focused radio show, Living Lab Radio. Woodwell Climate Research Center is located on the traditional and sacred land of the Wampanoag people who still occupy this land and whose history, language, traditional ways of life, and culture continue to influence this vibrant community. Woodwell Climate Research Center in Falmouth, Mass., advances scientific discovery and solutions to address the world's climate challenges. Originally founded as the Woods Hole Research Center in 1985, their world-leading research and education helps individuals, communities, and nations understand the realities of climate change, recognize the impact it is having everywhere on our planet, and embrace the urgent action needed to safeguard the future of life on Earth. Now, I wanted to start with a little bit of um, an interactive uh, exercise here, and feel free to drop answers in the chat or to just think about this on your own. But when I say the word climate, what is the first next word that comes to mind for you? And I'll give you a second to, to think about that. What, what's the word that comes after climate in your mind? Crisis, warmth, all right, change. A couple of people say change. So I did a little bit of, of brainstorming this and thinking about what are a bunch of the different options and then also looking around, just doing some Google searching, came up with this little bit of a, a jumbled word cloud here of possible ways to complete that phrase. Um, and there are plenty of them. Climate change, of course, is the probably the most common technical term um, for what we're experiencing right now. Climate crisis is another phrase that is increasingly used. I tend to prefer climate emergency, and that's um, maybe me being just a little bit of a, of a pedant about which word exactly you choose, but think for a second about your mental image of a crisis. My mental image of a crisis is war of the worlds people running around in the streets, pulling their hair out, screaming, chaos, questioning, or maybe it's your midlife crisis and it's uh, reactive and uh, again, confusion and chaos um, in my mind really go with crisis. And that may be where some of us are, unfortunately, when it comes to climate, but I don't think it's where we should be. An emergency in my mind has a different connotation and this was really driven home for me. Um, by uh, a member of the, the Woodwell community, uh, Dr. Bill Muma, who was uh, for a long time uh, the chair of our board and, and continues to be a, a collaborator with, our, with us. And a couple of years ago, he was part of a group of scientists who put out uh, a peer-reviewed publication, scientific publication, declaring a climate emergency. And that was then signed on to by over, I think eventually it was 14,000 um, people, scientists who signed on to that. And he explained emergency and why that word to me in two ways. He said, there are two parts to an emergency. The first is that it's a life-threatening situation. But the second part to it is that it's actionable. So if it were life-threatening, but there were nothing we could do about it, that would be a tragedy. And if it were life-threatening and we didn't really know what to do about it, that might be a crisis. But it's life-threatening and we know what to do about it. That's an emergency and that's where we are. And so that's how I wanna frame um, uh, my time with you tonight is talking about this in the, the framing of an emergency. So we're gonna talk first, and I'll tell you that we're gonna talk first about the life-threatening part. Um, and I'll make the case that this really is an emergency. It really is life-threatening and, and existential in, in the scale of the threat, but then also that it is actionable, that we have tools and options at our disposable. We know what we need to do. We just need to do it. Okay, so climate emergency, let's go back uh, basic, 
pretty much to basics. Um, I took out the, the explanation of the greenhouse gas theory. We can go back to that if you want, but let's just look at where we are right now, this moment in time and where our climate system is. So what we're looking at here is a record of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere over the past 10,000 years. Um, the past uh, really just several decades is actual measurements from the atmosphere. The rest of this is scientists being able to go back and drill into ice and look at the carbon dioxide that was trapped in that ice when it was formed and from that extrapolate how much was in the atmosphere. And what you see is that over 10,000 years, there have been these little you know, wiggles in that line, there have been ups and downs, certainly. But on the grand scheme of things, it's been pretty stable until about 100 years ago, at which point we see this sharp, sharp uptick. And we are now way up over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, if we zoom out even further for context on where we are, how uh, critical is this moment in human history, you know, you may have heard people say, well, the climate has always changed on this planet. There have been periods of warmth and been periods of cold, and that's absolutely true. But if we look at 800,000 years of Earth history, what you see are, yes, quite dramatic ups and downs, but still nothing compared to where we are today up in that top right corner. And if we look at it in the scope simply of human history, I've put this red line on there at around 200,000 years ago, roughly when modern humans emerged. Again, you see nothing in the evolutionary history of human beings that matches what we are um, doing to our atmosphere and our climate system right now. Um, this was reflected, this of course, the, the reason this matters um, is carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, it's warming the planet. So if we look at the effect that it's had on actual temperatures of the planet, uh, what we see in, in these graphs are from uh, the most recent uh, synthesis of climate science released by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released uh, this past summer. And they state there that the human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2000 years. Again, you see with temperatures, this up and down, and then a stark uptick uh, over the past hundred years. And in fact, over, if you look on the left side of the screen, there's this blue gray bar and a little arrow pointing to it. It says warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. So again, getting that bigger perspective in terms of time, and we are outside of the warmest period in more than 100,000 years. So again, in over much of the evolutionary history of humans, we are outside of that. And in particular, if you think about either the past 2,000 years or the past 10,000 years, that's really the period in which what we now think of as um, the underpinnings of modern civilization, agriculture and urbanization, really came to the fore. What that means is that uh, a stable climate was essentially the underpinning of all human evolution and the development of modern civilization. And we have now left the bounds of what we have, um, has been that underpinning. That in and of itself should be cause for significant alarm. Um, but of course, just warming by itself is not the full extent of climate change. That's why we shifted from calling it global warming, which is part of the phenomenon, the, the, the base of the phenomenon, to climate change. Because when we have a warmer ocean, the water expands and ice melts and we see sea level rise. When uh, the atmosphere warms, that and the warmer water are fuel for stronger storms. A warmer atmosphere can hold more water, which means more precipitation. So we see a whole range of changes in our climate system related to that fundamental warming. But I think it's really important to recognize that that warming, while it is ubiquitous, is not uniform. So here we're actually looking at ocean temperatures, and I put this first. I know that's not usually where our thoughts about uh, climate change go, but the ocean, first of all, is my first love. And second of all, is the place where over 90% of the excess heat trapped by human greenhouse gas emissions has ended up. The ocean, of course, covers the majority of the planet. It is an enormous volume of liquid, and it has buffered uh, the temperature change that we have actually seen as a result of our own greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> 
but it's not uniform, as you can see here, where redder means more change uh, and uh, more warming, and bluer means uh, a change to be a bit cooler. And what you see is that uh, with that black box right in the middle where we are located, uh, the ocean off the northeast coast of the United States is actually warming faster than 99.9% .9 of the ocean. It's one of the fastest warming places on the globe for a whole range of reasons, some of which are, are not fully settled. Um, but that has a range of impacts on our ocean ecosystems, many of which you are probably familiar with in terms of shifting where uh, commercially exploited species are actually found, in terms of growth rates of uh, plants and animals and food availability for animals in the waters off of our coast. Of course, it's not uh, just in the ocean that we see differences in the rates of warming. And what you're seeing here is an animation of about 130 years worth of temperature data uh, put together by NASA into this video. Again, bluer temperatures, cooler, red, orange colors, warmer, um, warmer than average. And what you're seeing is as we go through time, and in particular, as we get to about the last three decades, you see this very dramatic warming, still not uniform. Um, and in fact, one of the things that is uh, most important about looking at this uh, variation in warming is just how red the Arctic is up there at the top. The Arctic, uh, for a number of reasons, is warming at least three times faster than the global average. Um, and you can see that really dramatically here in this um, fabulous map that, that colleagues here at Woodwell Climate put together where if you take uh, expected warming in degrees and kind of convert that to elevation, what you see is almost this mountain growing out of the top of the planet that is the disproportionate warming of the Arctic. Now, why am I hammering home how much it's warming in the Arctic? Well, it's because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. There are millions of people who live there and they are experiencing dramatic impacts and we should also be concerned about that. Um, but for many people, that's maybe not, um, you know, it's not until it's right in your own backyard. And the thing is that what's happening in the Arctic really is in all of our backyards. Why is that? Well, that's because the difference in temperature between the Arctic, which typically would be cooler than the mid-latitudes, and mid-latitudes like where we are, that temperature difference is what sets up the winds of the jet stream, which is what you're seeing here, this wavy green, yellow, orange, uh, line, this river in the atmosphere, that is the jet stream. And the jet stream is uh, one of the major determiners of our weather systems. And as, um, so how does it determine our, our weather systems? Well, it, it's kind of bringing fronts through. And if um, you look at this map here of just kind of a, uh, you know, hypothetical jet stream configuration, to, to the north of the jet stream would be typically colder and to the south of the jet stream would be warmer. Now, as the temperature difference between the Arctic and the rest of the world gets smaller because it's warming, it's, it's no longer that much colder than the rest of the globe. And in fact, there have been times in the past few years where we've seen um, rather anomalous and disturbing situations where the Arctic is actually warmer than places like Massachusetts. Um, that, that jet stream, that wind, the strength of it reduces. There's not as much driving that, and it tends to get wavier. The waves get bigger and they don't move as fast. It kind of gets stuck. And what that can lead to is things like we've seen um, just in the past year. It can lead to things like incredible cold spells as far south as Texas, which we saw last February. Um, and it can lead to immense heat waves in places like the Pacific Northwest, where we would never expect to see um, such high temperatures. And unfortunately, um, what we saw with both of these events, with the extreme cold in Texas and with the extreme heat in the Pacific Northwest, is that climate change right now is deadly. Uh, we uh, unfortunately lost hundreds, several hundred people that we know of to the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest this year. Um, and so these, these changes in our climate are here and now, and they are um, really profound. If we think about 
this kind of jet stream and you know warm in one place, cold in another, the way that sets up. That also sets us up for things like fire uh, in the West and flooding along the Gulf Coast and Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi River, also uh, things that of course we have seen in the past couple of years. And again, these are profound impacts that cost lives and livelihoods, um, economic damage and human damage. But again, I think it's important to recognize uh, that while not only the effects uh, are different in different places, um, our vulnerability to these events varies dramatically from place to place and community to community. So what I'm showing you here is from the Massachusetts State Environmental Justice Mapping uh, application and uh, all of the communities in kind of green and yellow and purple, all these different colors that are not the background gray. These are different dimensions of uh, environmental justice communities right here in the state of Massachusetts. So these are low income, uh, higher percentage minority, higher percentage uh, non-English speaking and immigrant, um, and some combination of those um, factors that lead to these communities being um, categorized as environmental justice communities. And we know that in Massachusetts, even though Massachusetts is uh, generally thought of as a, a pretty green state and a pretty blue state, a pretty liberal state, a progressive state, um, we still have really stark disparities in uh, environmental impacts between these environmental justice communities and other communities or predominantly white communities. It can be orders of magnitude difference in exposure to environmental risks like um, power generating stations or uh, hazardous waste or waste disposal uh, facilities and a, a range of other environmental risks. And I think it's really important that we keep that in mind as we think about solutions for climate change because some of the researchers who, who really initiated this work here in Massachusetts looking at our environmental disparities point out that in a progressive state like Massachusetts that uh, has a history of trying to do the right thing, sometimes when we try to do the right thing without explicitly thinking about issues of environmental justice, we end up incidentally doing harm. And one of the examples they give is uh, when we banned dumping trash into the ocean that created the necessity of disposing of uh, waste on land and without strong protections and um, uh, a real attention to where those were cited, those overwhelmingly ended up cited in these vulnerable communities. That disparity and uh, invulnerability and risk also shows up on a global scale. And here I'm showing you a photo from the capital of uh, the nation Kiribati, uh, which is a low lying Pacific Island nation. Um, these nations, some studies have shown could be completely underwater uh, literally no land um, to constitute their country by later this century. And legal scholars have responded to this uh, strong possibility by creating a new designation. It hasn't really been formally put into practice, but a concept of nations ex situ, nations which actually have no land um, to, to call their own. Um, well before that, uh, issues that the nation of Kiribati is already facing are things like the inundation of uh, drinking water supplies with salt water and the loss of agricultural land because of course flooding with salt water it doesn't have to be under salt water uh, for long or permanently for there to be damage to the ability of that land to grow food and so even before the land is actually gone the land could be uninhabitable within the next few decades and uh, just this past fall the uh, environment minister from another small island uh, state, uh, Tuvalu, gave his address to the UN climate negotiations uh, in November, standing in the water to drive home uh, the existential risk that his nation faces from climate change. And it's really, um, I would say, largely as a result of these nations and their clear understanding of the risk that they face that we ended up um, in 2015 in Paris, uh, climate negotiations actually uh, setting a more ambitious goal. Prior to that, the kind of agreed upon uh, goal of those UN negotiations had been to limit total average global warming to two degrees Celsius. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and it was, I, I really 
think largely as a result of these nations, and there was a uh, some activists coined the phrase 1.5 to stay alive, um, that, that that more ambitious and aspirational goal of limiting warming to one and a half degrees really ended up in that agreement. So that really has become 1.5 has become the more accepted um, goal and what everyone is aiming for in large part because I think uh, we've all been forced to realize um, that two degrees was never actually safe. Um, it was a goal that was set best based on the best available science at the time to avoid the worst, most catastrophic impacts of climate change. And likewise with 1.5, it's not safe. We are at just over one degree right now of total average global warming, and already we are seeing um, really profound impacts uh, around the world. And again, going back to that most recent report from uh, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, their, their statement on, on where we are with regard to any of these goals is that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 C will be beyond reach, right? So think about that. We've already warmed the planet a little over one degree. We're talking about needing to, or wanting to, to stop that in less than another half degree. Um, doing that is, is going to require, as I said, really dramatic action. And to date, we have not even set our sights um, high enough or low enough, however you want to say it, ambitiously enough, um, based on the commitments made to date coming out of, of COP26 this past November, um, estimates are that we're on track for about two and a half degrees of warming uh, this century. And it's important to keep in mind that that's based on commitments if all of those commitments were met. And to date, we have not done a good job. And I don't just mean the US, I mean, we writ large, the world have not done a good job of living up to the commitments that we have made. However, and here's where I wanna switch from, <laughs> this is the life threatening and the, the scope of what we're up against to here's what we can do about it. We do still have the power to shape our climate trajectory, to shape our climate future. So what I'm showing you here, uh, Ignore all the, the kind of letters and numbers, the gobbledygook on the, the right-hand side there. That's the technical names for different climate models, different scenarios that researchers have built to say, okay, if we do this, where does it get us? And if we do this different thing over here, where does it get us? And the first really important thing that I want you to notice is that the difference between the top line and the bottom line is a really, really big difference. It's the difference between holding warming to right around one and a half degrees C and warming that continues well past four degrees and is not slowing down at the end of this graph at 2100. That top line is essentially we do nothing. It's often called, called business as usual, but many people have pointed out that business as usual has changed a lot in the past 10 years, and it's not necessarily the most useful way to frame it. But so that's essentially unchecked emissions, not really paying attention to climate change as an issue and just um, development and uh, energy and all of those things um, uh, without real concern for that. At the bottom, those bottom two um, are where we, we get closer to the goals that we want to see and we actually manage to level off warming or perhaps even uh, start to decrease uh, the the, the amount of warming, you know, so we, we kind of hit about 1.6 degrees and come back. So I think it's really important to recognize that according to these scenarios, um, no matter what we do, we are likely to hit one and a half, almost certain to hit one and a half degrees of warming sometime in the early 2030s. What we do now though, that doesn't mean that what we do doesn't matter. What we do now will matter in 10, 20, 50, 100 years. And that's often really hard for us to work into our calculations and our decision-making and our thinking. What we do now isn't going to make a difference tomorrow. It's probably not even going to make a difference in what we'll see 10 years from now, but it has the power to make a fundamental difference in what we see further into the future. Um, and the other thing that I think it's important to note is that these models do show that it is possible to cap and again, potentially even cool. Now, I think it's important to recognize, it's really, really important to recognize that those scenarios don't include 
um, certain things, it's going to be harder than any of those scenarios suggest to actually cap warming and certainly to, to drop the temperature again. And this is another example of what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So Arctic ground, much of the Arctic, uh, the ground is what's known as permafrost. Perma, permanently, frost, frozen. Um, this is ground that stays frozen for multiple years running and in some cases has been frozen for decades, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. And over the course of that time, it has built up an enormous store of carbon, twice as much carbon as is currently in the atmosphere, three times as much carbon as is in all the forests in the world. And as the Arctic warms, which you'll recall, I said it's doing three times faster than the global average, that ground is thawing, that carbon is being uh, released into the atmosphere, either directly or through the action of, of microbes kind of eating at it and, and releasing it. And that carbon going into the atmosphere is largely going uncounted in our models and our scenarios for the future. Why? In part, because we haven't had a great handle on just how big that number for permafrost thaw emissions might be. Um, that's something that scientists here at the center are working on um, and have, have really been leaders in um, to get that taken into account. But what that means is that there's a source of emissions that is currently growing that we can't just turn off. The only way to turn it off is to stop global warming or reduce the, the average temperature of the globe. So, um, it is a life-threatening situation that is actionable. We know that we have the potential still to control this. We need to control this. How do we actually do that? Um, and I wanna just uh, address one point. This is actually a, kind of a mock-up of a sticker that, that the center created prior to me joining the center. It was one of the things that made me want to join the team here. Um, and it was, a square sticker, one of those little like, you know, two and a half, three inch square kind of bumper sticker um, sorts of things, but otherwise looked basically like this slide and just said, climate change is real. Humans are causing it. Humans will stop it. And there was something about the directness of those statements that really struck me because often the fact that we are causing this problem uh, again, is one of those things that gets us all hung up in guilt and we don't want to admit it because that means that we did something bad. But the fact of the matter is, it's actually, it, it's our superpower. The fact that we have caused this much change should make us realize the agency and the power that we have to shape our climate future. And that means we have the power to stop what's currently going on. We can't undo what has already been done, at least not uh, on any time scale that is, is relevant to any of us or our children or grandchildren, um, but we can stop the, the decline. Um, and we know exactly where um, the, the problem is coming from, right? Current climate change, this is another of those statements from the, the IPCC, current climate change is wholly and unequivocally the result of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, and very specifically, we know where those emissions come from. So this is a pie chart of global emission sources. It's different if you look at the U.S. specifically. Um, you know, that, that breakdown is a little bit different. But generally speaking, uh, some of the biggest contributors are, of course, uh, electricity and heat production, the energy sector. Um, transportation is another big one. If you look specifically at the U.S., it tends to be a bigger piece of the pie. Globally, it's, it's about uh, 14%. Industrial processes, manufacturing and other industrial processes are a huge one. And then there's this big one that I uh, kind of left to last because it takes a little bit more explanation potentially, and that's agriculture, forestry, and other land use. And look at how big that is. So if you look at the U.S. version of this, it's typically just called agriculture, and it's about 10% of our emissions. So food production is a huge part of our emissions. Um, that number goes up when we look globally in particular because deforestation is a huge source of emissions. Um, and it's one that uh, we could actually flip on its head and turn into a solution. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But knowing where the emissions are coming from means that we have been able to develop technologies 
to abate those uh, emissions. So we have renewable sources of energy, solar panels and uh, wind turbines. Yes, we need better batteries. Uh, yes, we can always make these technologies better, but we have um, scalable, deployable technologies for renewable energy, and we are seeing those growing in really encouraging ways, and in many cases, seeing them outpace um, fossil fuel power development. We have ways to make our buildings much more efficient so that we don't need to use as much energy uh, in order to heat or cool our homes. Uh, we, of course, with renewable energy as a source of electricity, can then electrify uh, processes like transportation that have been largely uh, fueled, literally, by, by fossil fuels. Um, we can now produce things that, that seem an awful lot like meat, but are actually made by plants or made from plants um, and uh, have significantly lower carbon and water footprints than meat itself. And of course, along the lines of uh, making our buildings more efficient, we can simply opt out of uh, certain types of transportation. We can bike or walk instead of uh, taking a car or a bus sometimes. And similarly with our diets, we can simply opt out of meat and some of the higher carbon footprint foods that are in our diets to a certain extent. Um, now I mentioned forestry, forest deforestation or, or forest conservation as another thing that we could actually turn from part of the problem to part of the solution. And I should say it, it's already part of the solution. I already mentioned oceans absorbing a lot of the carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere. Together, uh, land-based ecosystems and oceans have absorbed over half of the greenhouse gas emissions that we have put into the atmosphere to date. It is huge. And we would be in a lot more trouble if we didn't have those working for us. And that's because plants, as they grow, of course, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, in the case of oceans, it kind of goes through the food web and some of that can end up going down to the bottom of the ocean where it becomes uh, maybe not locked away permanently, but uh, inaccessible to the atmosphere for a very long time. And similarly, in the case of forests, those trees are pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, they're building, their, the, the tree itself, um, their woody uh, bodies, they're also putting carbon down into the soil. And interestingly, in a lot of forests, uh, most of the carbon can actually be in the soil rather than in the wood. But the wood is um, uh, about half, it, it varies by plant, uh, you know, tree type and, and forest type and that sort of thing, but can be about half carbon. So when we cut those trees, that carbon uh, is in a lot of cases, if it's burned, um, in particular, that carbon is released back to the atmosphere. Um, and it's really important to recognize that in a lot of our uh, forestry and, and wood harvesting practices these days, we tend to think that, well, if I cut that tree to use it and I plant a new tree over here, that's carbon neutral, right? And the problem is that it might be over scales of decades or centuries, but we don't necessarily have that amount of time right now. And if you look at it just in an immediate sense, um, if we look at it in an immediate sense, a large mature tree is already storing a huge amount of carbon in the tree itself and shunting that carbon down into the soil. Um, and as that large tree grows, it's adding a lot of carbon to those stores. Small trees are growing faster, but they just aren't big enough to store and absorb the same amount of carbon. And it could take a newly planted tree decades to centuries to catch up to a, a truly mature tree, an old growth tree. Um, so it's really important to think about uh, preventing deforestation, not just planting new trees um, in its place. We really need to, um, stop the deforestation, stop that loss of carbon and enable those, uh, those forests to really do the job that they have been doing um, of absorbing and storing carbon. Um, and I, I just show this here to give you a sense of what's driving deforestation and how stark the difference can be. This is a picture from the Brazilian Amazon um, where of course, 
uh, forests are constantly being cut in particular to make way for agriculture, which we already talked about the um, emissions from agriculture. Deforestation is part of that. Uh, the actual food production, the transportation of food, and in some cases, if it's uh, red meat, if it's cows, um, their digestive processes add to the, the emissions as well. So the choices that we make wherever we are in terms of what we eat, uh, for that matter, a lot of reporting at the end of 2021 was focused on um, how illegally deforested land uh, kind of illegal deforestation makes its way into the food chain, or not the food chain, sorry, the supply chain for things like leather interiors for cars and fashion. So the choices that we make um, as individuals do have a profound, uh, have the potential to have real impact. But I think we need to be really careful when we think about this problem um, of not getting sucked into focusing only on individual action and again, not getting sucked into guilt. Because while our individual actions are really important, one of the most important things they do is actually affect our psychology and our willingness to take on other actions. Um, obviously, we're going to need collective action, the, the additive effects of all of our individual actions, but we also need systemic change because it's simply not possible or quite frankly fair to put the burden of making choices about our food and where our clothes and all of these things come from um, when there aren't necessarily always uh, good or accessible or affordable options for people to make. So we need to really think about what are the things that we as individuals can do to affect systemic change as well as affecting um, our own impact. And so that's one reason that I actually uh, show that pie chart of global emissions and explicitly do not show uh, there are pie charts of you know what the average American individual carbon footprint, where that comes from. Uh, because uh, if you didn't already know this, the, the phrase carbon footprint was actually coined by BP to put the emphasis on individuals and take it off of systems and uh, large corporations. So I think we need to, to push back on that as well. That's not saying don't do anything for sure. Um, but I think actually one of the most important things that we can all do right now uh, is not any of those technologies and it's not really any of those lifestyle changes. It's, it's a fair bit simpler and at the same time harder than that. And that's to talk to each other. So why, why does talking to each other matter? Well, what I'm showing you here is a map uh, from the Global Warming Six Americas project uh, of Yale and uh, George Mason University and, and others, where they're constantly doing public opinion polling around climate change. They've been doing it for going on 12 years. And uh, what they've done here is break down the uh, percentage of uh, population county by county across the United States that uh, understands that climate change is real and human caused. And what you can see here is that perhaps surprisingly, um, in virtually every county in the United States, a majority of residents understand that climate change is happening in human cause. Now, it may not be a very strong majority, and it definitely varies from place to place, but I don't think uh, that most of us, if asked, would, you know, do the majority of Americans in every county in the United States understand that climate change is, is happening in human caused we'd say no, right? We've been told that that it's far lower than that. Um, here in Massachusetts, if we look at public opinion, uh, the consensus is quite a bit stronger. Uh, about three quarters understand that climate change is happening, uh, close to 60% that it's caused by human activities. Unfortunately, our understanding of uh, the scientific consensus uh, tends to be lower, so about 55% say most scientists think it's happening. Interestingly, it's a much higher number that think global warming is affecting the weather, and I should put a caveat here that, in fact, uh, this project just released their most recent um, report yesterday or today. I haven't had a chance to update my slides, but what I can tell you is that the number of Americans that are alarmed or concerned about climate change has jumped because we can all see that it's affecting the weather. 
we have a pretty good understanding here in Massachusetts as well of, of the risks that we face, um, right? People are worried about it. We understand that it's going to harm ecosystems and future generations, people in developing nations. It's when we get down to the bottom here and, and think about, is it actually gonna hurt me? Or is it already hurting me and my neighbors where the numbers drop? And I think those are probably increasing now that we understand and are seeing, unfortunately, the impacts around um, our country and around the world. We're understanding that it's harming us personally, but those numbers are a little bit lower. And this is where I think talking to each other can really come in because this same survey shows that only about 35% of Massachusetts residents say they discuss climate change at least occasionally. And this same project did uh, some polling around the Green New Deal before it was actually introduced. Uh, they did a bunch of polling, not mentioning it as a piece of legislation, just kind of pulling out the things that were expected to be in there. Green job creation, expansion of renewable energy, research and deployment, um, tax incentives for renewable energy and electric vehicles, regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant. On all of these issues prior to the Green New Deal being introduced, eight out of 10 Americans agreed, yes, those are the things we should do. That to me was shocking. What then happened though, was that the Green New Deal was introduced as a piece of legislation introduced by two liberal Democrats attacked by conservative Republicans and four months later asking those same questions, the support was down to six out of 10 Americans and that drop was among Republicans. So when we're not talking to each other, we don't realize perhaps how much we actually agree on and we're taking our cues from quite frankly, people for whom it is in their best interest to perpetuate the status quo and not act um, as quickly and dramatically as we need to act. And I think there is real power in us talking to each other, understanding how much we might share in terms of our values, uh, in terms of valuing um, nature and healthy ecosystems and a healthy future for our children um, and pushing back again on this idea that we're super divided and that climate change is only for some of us or climate action is only for some of us. So I would encourage you all to um, keep learning about the issue of climate change, keep sharing what you learn and talk to people about uh, what you're learning because we have a lot of work ahead of us. We need to get from climate emergency back to safe and stable. And that is going to require uh, a Herculean effort uh, from all of us. All right, with that, I will stop my screen share and um, would be thrilled to take any questions that you might have. Um. Thank you so much, Heather. I just was really struck by all the different, you know, bits of information. I'm really glad we got a chance to record this because it's going to take me a couple of watchings to uh, to to really get all of this in my brain. Um, so we have one question from the chat room that came up, which is, "What are the system systemic changes that can take place or need to be encouraged?" Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think there's a whole host of them. Um, I'll give you one example um, from the, the past year. Um, over the past few years or several years, many, and this is actually individual corporations versus the entire economy, but um, many individual corporations have recognized that they face risks from climate change and they've started looking into that and some of them have actually started disclosing that information about their the risks that they face right that gives that information gives not only that corporation um the the information they need to to respond adjust their supply chains adjust their operations reduce their risk but it also gives then investors and consumers information on which to base their decisions now, when a few corporations do that, that's one thing and it's good. But what we really need is for that to be required and the standard. We need everybody to be doing that. And the SEC is actually working on that. So this past June, the SEC put out a call for public comment on 
um, the idea of regulating climate risk disclosure. We, among many others, submitted public comment and said, yes, not only does this absolutely need to happen that we mandate climate risk disclosure, but we need to make sure that the information, the, the risk assessments themselves are high quality, that they're standardized, that they're transparent so that we can compare across them, right? So that needs to become systemic, that we're assessing climate risk and we're making it accessible to everybody. That's one example of going from kind of sporadic to systemic change, and, and that has the power to really shift things on an economic scale. Um, similarly, uh, you know, if we think about some of the things that we as individuals might do, um, right now, renewable energy, you can select, you know, as a consumer to, to purchase 100% renewable energy from your utility, or you can put uh, install renewable energy at your home. You can put up solar panels or a wind spire, that sort of thing. We need that to not be just an individual choice being that, that can be made by those who can afford it. And instead we need renewable energy, of course, to be the system and equally accessible to everyone of all means. So that's a, an example of going from let's do it kind of um, uh, individually and and uh, voluntarily to it needs to become the system and whether that happens through market forces um, or regulation, uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways that that can can happen. Um, but it's in that regard that we need to think about the fact that it needs to be a systemic shift. And that's for a number of reasons. That's because of the scale um, of of the changes that we need to make. But it's also, again, coming back to this this. Um, theme of environmental justice, right? We can't, uh, climate action needs to not just be something um, that those of us with the greatest means are able to opt into. Climate action needs to be something that is accessible for everyone and is benefiting everyone. Okay, we had another question. Um, and I'm not sure that we're going to answer the first part, which is how well is President Biden doing? Um, because that's a really broad question. But um, the, the person asks about the, that um, we're having new oil leases in the United States off the West Coast. And I also um, was made aware that the use of coal in the United States has gone up dramatically in the past year, which I was pretty shocked by. Um, how can we be sure that these kinds of things aren't, aren't happening? I mean, um, vote. <laughs> vote, uh, talk to uh, friends and family members and encourage them to do the same, uh, right? The, all of those things that you just mentioned and, and how is President Biden doing? As you mentioned, there's, there's multiple parts to that. I'll, I'll yeah. overly simplify it to two parts of the equation. There's what he wants to do and what he's able to do within our current political climate. And what the Biden, and I won't just say he, what the Biden administration, this large uh, group of people, wants to do um, what they are proposing are all of the right things, right? But how are they doing on actually getting them done? Not very good. Um, that, that's, you know, so again, and that comes back to what's the system around them. Um, we need to make climate change a voting issue. And I am not here to tell you who to vote for or, you know, um, what party to be part of. I don't think that should even be part of the climate change conversation, but I think what we need um, to do, and I, I think unfortunately what mother nature is doing for us is forcing us to realize um, that we haven't had our priorities right when we've been voting. So for years, if you ask voters, is climate change important? Should the government be doing more? Yes, it's important. We should be doing more. But if you ask them, ask them to actually rank climate change um, in relationship to a whole bunch of other issues that we tend to think of as vote deciding issues around the economy or healthcare or education, um, climate change just quickly falls down the list because we think it's a distant problem for somebody else some other time. And I need to worry about my pocketbook and my health insurance and my kids and my house right now. And we need to realize that actually climate change needs to be at the very top of that list because it underpins the stability of all of those other systems and it is impacting us now and will continue to impact us. So it needs to be uh, one of the number one voting issues. And, and I think we saw that 
actually in the last election, right? I mean, it, that was just um, a, a sea change in terms of like it, as a reporter prior to my current job as a reporter for years, I've like watched State of the Union addresses and presidential debates and counted how many times they say climate change or even just say climate. Um, and it was, it was single digits. It was one hand. It was like in an entire presidential campaign, somebody might say climate change twice, right? And we went from that to suddenly this is one of the biggest issues. You can't even, you know, get to the, the top of the democratic ticket without having the most ambitious climate plan. And it's multiple questions in presidential debates about climate change. So I think we're seeing that shift, um, but it's, it's really got to continue. Okay, we had another pretty specific question about carbon taxing. Um, what does the Woodwells Center think about that? And yeah, um, does, I, I would does say everyone know, I guess, what that is maybe as a starting point? Well, so, um, so there are a lot of different ways that a carbon tax or more broadly a price could be put on carbon. Um, and I will say, you know, we, we, um, stay away from taking a stance on any particular legislation um, or proposal. But, you know, if you just were a science organization and if you look at all of the, the research that economists and social scientists have done, putting a price on carbon uh, is one of the most effective things that we could do to drive all of the systemic changes that we need um, and do it through market forces instead of, of regulation, right? If, if putting carbon into the atmosphere costs you and makes things more expensive, then the alternatives are going to end up being cheaper um, and we're going to move in that direction. Um, so, you know, I think it can also be hard to, you know, like I said, we, we don't really take a stance on particular legislation um, and without getting to the scale of particular legislation, it can also be a little hard to say, like, do you take a stance on carbon taxes or not? Because how you enact a carbon tax or a carbon fee or a price on carbon can have wildly different effects. This is kind of going back to if you do the right thing, but you don't, uh, if you're trying to do the right thing, but you're not taking into account some of the potential side effects, you can end up doing more harm. So thinking about how you take into effect, if you suddenly put a, a tax on carbon, how does that affect uh, low income consumers and their ability to do fundamental things like get to work and heat their homes? And how do you um, apply the necessary economic pressure without um, further harming already disadvantaged and marginalized communities. So, you know, the, the nitty gritty in those proposals can, the devil's in the details, I guess. Right, right. Okay, I think um, we're almost at our, at our end point, And I think this is a perfect question from one of our board members is what suggestions do you have for, the, for our group, the Westport River Watershed Alliance, about how we can help to bring this um, issue to the forefront, how we can educate um, more people about this and, you know, if you can maybe wave your magic wand over our organization, what, what, what should we do to advance this conversation? Well, so first of all, um, making it a, a priority to, to talk about it and educate, um, I think is, is the first step, right? Second step is, and I, I didn't talk um, in a really specific local way about impacts, but um, especially for local and community-based groups, I think that's always a really great strategy is, is learn, figure out what the actual impacts uh, now are in your watershed and what the risks, the expected risks are. Start sharing that information with the people in your community. Make it an, an us here now issue um, for your community. And then um, don't just talk the talk walk the walk, right? Start being examples to the extent possible of um, the kinds of systemic changes that, that you would like to see. So, I mean, I, I talked a lot about not just overly focusing on individual action and we need systemic change, and that's absolutely true, but I will tell you that I also have as um, the background image on my laptop, um, a picture of uh, Gandhi and the quote, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? I, I think I, I can't, it is important. It normalizes um, 
it uh, is another aspect of that communicating what you value in a way that other people can see and relate to. Um, so I do think it's really important that to the extent possible, we, um, we model the change, the, the broader change that we want to see. Great. Well, thank you. That's, that's a wonderful presentation. And um, I don't see any other comments. If you want to ask another question and you want to unmute yourself, now is your chance. And otherwise, we're going to say thanks. Um, uh, we've gotten, you know, thank yous and wonderful presentations in the chat. People are really impressed by your articulate, passionate, and, and very, um, very thoughtful way of presenting this. And I, I really appreciate that, particularly around the idea that, that we have to be part of the change and we need to get moving. So um, anything else out there? Understanding the difference between adaptation and mitigation, do you think it's important as people are talking to each other that that issue come up because most of what I see most of America doing is adaptation and there's talk and I know I attended with watershed members a three-day seminar a couple of years ago about mitigation and adaptation here in the south coast and as an elected person I know it's still in this town as we do planning difficult to consider adaptation which also mitigates some of the problem and because it seems like there really has to be mitigation that just moving somebody from a flooding suburb in Louisiana to a non-flooding suburb in Arkansas doesn't fix the problem. And it's actually more expensive and more problematic than actually trying to mitigate the problem. And, and, and that that should be part of the conversation the difference between adaptation and mitigation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, 10, 20 years ago, the, the adaptation versus mitigation, where do we put our focus might have been a valid debate. At this point, um, it, it's not an either or, it's absolutely an and, uh, because we are already facing um, devastating impacts and they are going to get worse. We have to uh, think about adaptation and resilience. Um, and at the same time, we have to recognize that there are limits to what we can adapt to. And so we have to mitigate to limit the full scope of the impacts that we'll, we will face. It's not an either or. We can't um, debate anymore. You know, I think again, 10 plus years ago, this, this debate is going on and, and people are saying, oh, well, if we introduce the idea of adaptation, then all people will do is adaptation and they'll forget mitigation. So we have to only talk about mitigation. Um, and that's not really an option anymore. And, and it's not going to work to only talk mitigation because people, you know, you're going to lose your credibility because people are going to say, I'm facing impacts, we have to adapt. Um, and so I think the important thing is to, yes, we have to adapt and we have to mitigate because there is a limit to how much we can adapt and just making sure that, that we, I would say more than separating them or making them two different parts of the conversation, we have to link them and make people understand um, how linked they really are. Heather, Mike Sullivan here. I just wanna thank you. That was a very illustrative and I think hopeful um, discussion. And as somebody who lives at 14 feet above sea level, knowing there's 210 feet of, of sea level locked up in Antarctica and Greenland, I, I just think the message of communication and um, uh, it is really cool. It's really good. And I just hope we can develop the tolerance and curiosity to have those conversations and move forward. So less a, less a question than a comment. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I think um, one one thing that groups like yours have as a, a strength that you can bring to bear, um, I love talking with, with faith-based uh, groups about this issue because I really do think there are values that are almost universal. They're far deeper than our political affiliations. Um, anybody who has had a childhood experience with a, a natural 
place, right? Where they've been able to, to form any sort of association or relationship with a natural place. We are hardwired to connect with nature and to value that and, and to, to find that sustaining. And so that's one place where, you know, this is our watershed, whether it's through fishing or boating or walking or however you connect with it, that's something that has the power to transcend political boundaries and connect people and can be a real entree to the conversations that we need to have about how our natural places are changing, how that impacts the lives that we are able to lead and what we need to do about that moving forward. Well, great. Well, thank you again, Heather. It's been a real pleasure and, um, and we will hope to see you in, in fewer years um, in between than we have had this time, this gap in our, in our contact with you. So, and we will keep fingers, toes, eyeballs, and everything else crossed that the next time it can be in person. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. Thank you. And as they say, thank you and goodbye and good night. It's been lovely, even at least to see some of your faces and to know that we all do care very much about our our local community and what climate change will do here, and also how um, devastating, you know, we've been seeing impacts all around the world. Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank it was you. my pleasure. Good night, everyone.